I think the important thing about the trial that was presented by Craig yesterday was that there was equivalence overall between surgery and TAVR and then if you look at the patients who were in the transfemoral arm those patients did uh, particularly well with TAVR and uh, that's very gratifying to see that outcome. When we were doing the animal work, we had about a 40% rate of embolization of uh, the devices. And there were several reasons for that. In the animal studies, the animals were young animals. So there was a annulus that was, to some extent, probably elastic. We did not have calcium in there to anchor the devices in the interstices of the valve. And then on top of that, we were working with a valve with a, with a cuff on it, so it probably made it in a sense more slippery. And so we actually got pretty despondent and when we did the in initial animals with a view to doing a transapicals in Leipzig when we were first rolling out the transapical approach, we actually put a hold on the first couple of patients until we gained enough confidence to do that. And so to see now these incredibly good results uh, in our research series at the Cleveland Clinic up till 2012, our mortality rate was only 0.4% for TAVA. Now it's gone up a bit as more c commercial patients, high risk patients are being done, for example, patients with renal failure. So it is amazing how good the results have become with 1% mortality rate and 1 to 2% stroke rate. And if you look at the all comers, it's not quite as good, but that's what we always expect in randomized trials. As a general rule, the results are better than the general population. When it comes to the percutaneous valves, I mean, that's pretty well rolled out. There's just under 400 sites now that met the margin. And, and the margin we set as a group, basically by the partner trial, which was recommended to uh, the FDA, et cetera, et cetera, CMS was 400 PCIs per year. That, that's been the, the threshold that a lot of places have struggled to cross. And I think that's appropriate. So yes, there is some restriction, but on the other hand, I think it's important that a program does uh, these TAVOs on a regular basis to keep up their quality. And so I, I think that there's, I believe, only two states, including Alaska, uh, that do not have TAVA. So basically it is available to everybody. Well, I think it's an exciting time uh, and the challenge will be for us who have responsibility for the financial aspects is to first of all have, and we believe in hybrid operating rooms for these patients. So making the space available in hybrid operating rooms to do this. I don't think the heart team is an issue financially that is a fraction of the cost of the valve devices, which is essentially 32,000 each. And for us who are not on the coast, either east coast or west coast, our reimbursement from CMS on the DRG basis is not as good as the other areas. So for us, it's much more of a challenge to not lose money on these, and we are losing money on these. And as we move into the lower risk categories, we're now dealing with the patients who don't have major comorbidities. So we get paid at an even lower rate and some of our rates barely cover just the cost of the valve and so that's going to be a challenge. The other thing that we don't know about is how is CMS going to respond to this? Because CMS spends 203, as 203 billion as of 2015 on hospital care in the United States. So that's Medicare Part A. And with that and the rollout of percutaneous valves, and let's assume here that we have some success with the mitral valves, we're potentially looking at at least four to six billion dollars spending on just percutaneous valves in the United States. That's two to three percent of the spending of Medicare on hospitals. Will that allow us to do that? That to me is going to be more of a challenge to cope with the cost of the devices, not the hard team, not the, whether this is a good device or not, it's going to, whether CMS is going to pay for it. I think it's going to be how much of a loss can we take? 
um, as institutions. And already there are a number of areas where we take a loss. For example, peripheral vascular disease management, uh, some of the atrial fibrillation stuff we're doing now, we've got Watchman 2 adding to the cost. We've got the issues with endovascular aortic, a lot of that we lose money on. And so there are a lot of areas that on Medicare patients, Medicare does not pay us adequately to cover the costs. And that to me is going to be the concern over time. How do we cope with that? And hopefully the companies will be able to bring their device costs down as they recoup increasingly the expenditure not only on the trial, but also in the development of the devices. The next one is Partner 3. And so Partner 3, we will be looking at patients who have a STS score less than 4, so they have to have a STS less than 4 and be older than 65. In the trial that was presented yesterday, the Partner 2, the average age was essentially 81, 82 years old. So that's still an elderly population. So now we're going to bring it down to a younger population and at least our data from what we have now on five-year data on the durability of the TAVR valves is looking very good. It looks equivalent to what we've seen with open AVRs. And it will probably be in this population only after 10, 12 years that we'll start seeing the structural deteriorations in these valves. The leaflets are the same thickness as the open AVRs we use. The only possibility is that crimping could affect the leaflets. I don't think that's an issue. And even if we have failures, and, and we begin to see this now, there's obviously the option of going back through the femoral artery again and putting a valve and valve and we've actually done a lot of valve and valves in the acute situation with very good results. So I really don't think that durability is going to be an issue uh, in these patients. So as we move into a younger population, I'm really not too concerned about durability in these patients.